Good morning. Happy Monday morning. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so happy to have you with us right now as my terror cat comes in and attacks as always, right? <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for joining us. We're so happy to have you this Monday morning um, here to talk about another way that you can use Adobe Spark for remote learning. My name is John Shoemaker from the Department of Educational Technology and uh, just a few housekeeping things before we get started. First and foremost, don't forget, everything is posted to our website, which is edtechtraining.palmbeachschools.org. We have um, all of our resources there. We've already had a, a Spark um, live stream already that has Tanya's presentation in the video, along with all the different ideas that she shared with us that day already posted. And uh, we will just add these resources as well to that page. Also, don't forget over there on the right side of the screen, is the chat and if you don't see it on the right side it might be kind of diagonal down there um if you have your your youtube channel full screen so look for the chat and uh please go in the chat and feel free to type your name and share with us um if you click in there for the very first time you may have to set up your channel so just set up your channel and uh start joining the conversation in addition, down below, you can see our YouTube name, which is the Palm Beach Educational Technology uh, Training Team. So that is uh, our channel. So you can feel free to subscribe to our channel. Go ahead and take a look at some of the 50, uh, I think we're at 54 videos now that we've made so far, uh, live streams from, across the, from people across the world that have shared their uh, ideas and thoughts with us. And as always, you can click the bell to get notified and click the like button to, uh, to give us a, a thumbs up here. So um, without further ado, um, I'm gonna introduce our, our guest today. She's a good friend of mine, um, great friend to have, uh, Tanya Avarith. And um, so she is uh, at Adobe. She's a, uh, a teacher evangelist, I believe it is. Uh, um, <laughs> close enough, right, uh, with Adobe. And um, so she's here to share with us how we can use Adobe Spark for remote learning. And what I love about this is that she's also gonna give us a lot of resources that you can literally take right now and use in your own uh, distance learning. And so we will be posting some of the links to those stuff in the chat, but also we'll be posting her whole presentation that has all the links uh, by themselves. So uh, with that, Tanya, I will turn it over to you and uh, you can get started. Hey everybody. Well, thank you so much, uh, John, for that lovely introduction. I'm so, Honored to be here again. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tanya Averett and I actually live in Palm Beach County. And so I uh, love working with you guys bec because you are my community. And I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to know John and the team, the amazing ed tech team here at Palm Beach County who let me come in and share some of my thinking with you. So prior to working at Adobe, which is only in this past year, I was a teacher uh, here in South Florida, a high school teacher. And I, uh, I actually taught a really cool class called Personal Branding and Digital Communication. But I've also taught social studies, English, I've taught elementary. Uh, I've really done the whole gamut. I've taught K through 12. I've been an educator for almost 15 years now. Now. And so I, you know, I'm always thinking and iterating and figuring out ways that I can be better and how I can reach my learners. So blended learning is something I've been doing for a long time. And so I'm going to share some best practices with you today. And I'm going to and I'm going to just walk you through our agenda. So I'm going to really be looking at how we might teach with Adobe Spark in a remote classroom. That's really the focus of today's session. And for the next 40 minutes, we're gonna really look at that question. And I'm gonna be sharing um, a friend of mine, her name is Rebecca Hare. I'm gonna share a little bit of some of her takeaways from the last two months, because I wanted to make sure that you understood that I didn't just come up here and say, uh, this is what you need to do in this environment. Because obviously, um, I've taught in a blended classroom, but I have not fully taught in an, a remote classroom in the way that you're teaching right now, but my very good friend Rebecca has for the last two months. So I got together with her and we came up with some best practices um, 
based on her experience in the classroom that I'm going to share with you. Um, I'm also going to share a little bit of her lessons learned and look at how, um, you know, she's kind of iterated and evolved her teaching over the last eight weeks. And I'm sure you all have amazing um, ideas and strategies that you've been iterating. So it'll be interesting in the chat to hear how some of these might resonate with you as well. And then I'm going to share 11 lessons that I created that I actually did teach myself over the last two months. And these were lessons that I created for students that I taught uh, twice a week online, um, a digital literacy curriculum for students that were in, um, they were like anywhere between third and eighth grade, but honestly, they could be adapted for high school as well. And so I'm, I've taken those lessons, I've fixed them up, and I've created this unit that I'm going to share with you that you could use in your classroom literally today, like not even tomorrow, like today, or you might decide you want to save them as a great introduction to the, uh, to the school year next year. So either way, I wanted to be able to share them with you and give you the opportunity to have access for me to walk you through them because I think you're going to find them really valuable. Um, we're then, we're also going to look at like just some basic workflow and, uh, yeah, so that, that's what we're going to be doing today. A lot to cover in the next 40 minutes. So after speaking with Rebecca, some of the things that her and I really wanted to, to, to kind of, we grappled around were like, what, what was working and what wasn't working because she would literally, Rebecca Harris is a high school teacher in St. Louis, um, she teaches um, high school classes, but again, these are applicable, I think, to all areas. But she was calling me, like, she's one of my best friends, and she was like, I don't feel very successful. I don't think I'm doing a very good job. I, you know, and, but by the way, she was, because she's an amazing teacher. But, you know, as a self-reflective teacher, I think we all kind of go through that moment of like, I don't, I think I'm failing my kids. And so... It was great to kind of see her journey unfold because over the course of the the last you know eight weeks, she's really come around and started to feel a little more success. And so she was able to break down that the uh, and attribute some of that sex uh, success to some of these areas that I'm going to talk about. So she sp she speaks about time uh, tool learning time plus creative exploration, plus realistic expectations is her kind of formula for student success um, despite reality constraints. So this really means this. When we're looking at the amount of time, especially when we're teaching with technology, that we're focusing on the tool, we want to make sure that the time spent on you know, learning the tool is minimal um, versus creative exploration and being much higher and re like really thinking about the the amount of time and realistic expectations that students we can have on our students and and based on your individual learner really taking into consideration that each student is coming to you with a different set of circumstance and um you know access and maybe parental you know, considerations and support. So all of these factors really play a big role in terms of how we think about developing our instruction. And I think we can all say that there's really no one size fits all because each of our learners is unique and is in a unique situation. So this might look very different in different parts of the country, depending on socioeconomic access to technology and what you know, parents uh, are the amount of time that in younger students, especially, are able to devote to having you know provide scaffolding for their children. Because as we all know, it's not going to always be so easy for all of our parents to support our learners. So we really want to think at like when we look at this 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 table, we want to look at the sorry this graph at the time learning the tool being much more minimal. And having the expectation that creative exploration has at least a bare minimum in terms of what we would 
consider a successful completion of the project. And so we, we want to be able to support those learners to be able to at least finish, but then also provide opportunities for those students who can do and want to do more. I think it's unfair to say, you know, just because you've hit grade level that you're done, that there's nothing left for you to do. We need to support the kids and scaffold the ones that need the extra help, but also make sure that the ones that can do more are also supported as well. And that's a really uh, fine line that we're always uh, dancing around with our learners. So I thought this was a great kind of formula to really think about, well, what does that mean? So I love this, 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 this graph and, and sort of understanding like that the way that we support our learners really, you know, depends on what, a, you know, the, the time constraints that students have as well. So when we look at like, here's this time on project and this is kind of successful. So you have the minimal amount of time and some creative exploration and they're done. And then, you know, providing some more scaffolding, some more opportunity for students with some time and energy, right? Maybe they have a little bit more, um, you know, time and a little more energy, but then you're going to have students that might have a lot more time and energy. They might be able to do more. And then this is where it gets super interesting. When you have kids that might have lots of time, a lot of parental support and a ton of energy. And this is where it gets kind of cool because you can start really mixing um, that together and providing a little bit more depth in the tools that you provide them and scaffold more activity for them to do as well. So this was a great example of that the idea of like how Rebecca framed her week, right? So from Monday through Friday, she uh, what she would do is assign new work and give students feedback. She would take the time to email her kids and her families. So she wanted to make sure that she was really on top of making like contacting her students seeing how they're doing. And what I love that she spoke about was she always starts her conversation with, hi, how are you? Benefit of the doubt that the, you know, that there's something might be going on in that child's life. And it's really not meant to be like, where is your project? Why haven't you completed last week's? It's really like, you know, how are you doing? And recognizing that there might be something going on and giving each child the benefit of the doubt. How can I help you? Right? So assigning new work and giving feedback, emailing, uh, kids and families round two that's on Tuesday seeing like well you know making sure like if there's any late turn-ins especially from the week before you know checking in lots of emails more feedback uh, reaching you know Wednesday reaching out to all students staff check-in calling parents to see if the student needs any help a gentle reminder about deadlines on Friday, on Thursday, asking if anyone needs needs help, and then checking emails and creating assignments for next week. So this is kind of how um, Rebecca had designed her weekend. For the students, it looks a bit different. So student receives a new project and feedback from last week. The student then has time to work and ask questions and respond to feedback. The student on Wednesday then receives an email from her asking if they need help, gets time to work and get help, and then has the project due. Now, you're going to see in a second the way that the projects are designed is they really build on each other. So from week to week, you're not necessarily starting something new, but what you're doing is you're incorporating feedback from the week before, and you're iterating, and then you're, 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 you're creating better quality work. So... In this case, each assignment includes responsive and intuitive technology tool. And so we say intuitive, like in this case, something that's super simple, but not necessarily um, simple in its complexity in the way that it looks. And that's where Adobe Spark is really powerful because kids can create really complex creations that look absolutely stunning and beautiful, but the tool itself is extremely intuitive. And it provides them with a lot of scaffolding in terms of the simplicity of how it's how you actually use it so that the project itself looks super, super complex. Students work with multiple ideas at a higher volume to build their critical eye for quality work. So instead of focusing on um, 
like just getting it done, like kind of busy work kinds of assignments where they, they, they it's one and done, they're finished. Instead, we focus on higher volume of a, of a project so that there's a ton of iteration and feedback so that students then are working on improving what they're doing as opposed to just getting it finished and handing it in for a grade. So this is a great opportunity to teach kids about feedback and how to give better feedback and receive better feedback so that not only from you but from each other they can they can create better iterations of their work and so more time than is spent on reflection feedback and iteration so i want to actually introduce to you my curriculum and so this was a program that i taught over the last eight weeks and it was actually an internal um, uh, class that I taught for kids that of employees at Adobe, which was kind of cool. I, I got to meet all these amazing students of employees that of colleagues that, from all over the world. Adobe is a big company, and I offered this on Teams. We used Microsoft Teams, and I had this class running twice a week. Uh, where I would meet with students and have them working on their projects. And so what I did was I took those uh, all the lessons that I created over the, the course of two months, and I broke them down into these 11 remixable lessons. And when you have access, you'll be able to um, just click on that link, and it'll take you to the, the wakelet that I have all of the lessons um, embedded in. And so when you go through them, there's these 11 lessons that basically scaffold a digital literacy slash fluency curriculum. Now, I really want to be clear about something with this curriculum. It This could be used in any subject area and adapted. This is not just for media specialists, even though, yes, it definitely um, could be something that is supported through the media specialists at your school. But this type of skill is something that is so important that shouldn't just be left. And, and I think we're seeing this now that we have kids that need to be more digitally literate. Um, that can't just be something that they get 30 minutes a week um, shipped off to the media specialist. This is something that I think is super important now that, that needs to be embedded in e every element of our curriculum because that if, this is something that they have to just be doing constantly and getting practice with. So using technology and learning how to create with technology can easily be embedded in a social studies assignment, can easily be embedded in a, in a um, English language arts um, assignment because it's the content can be adapted, but the skills that we're developing are cross-curricular. And so this is a great set of a unit that can also be adapted with, uh, you know, subject area um, standards as well. Um, reading, writing, uh, you know, research, all those pieces that you can do can be easily adapted. So for example, this was the first assignment and I love this assignment and this is a great, that's what I'm saying. And, and by the way, all these lessons don't have to be taught in, in, in sequence, you can pull some from lesson 10 and, and use that as your first. But I, this is just kind of how I sequenced it out myself. And so I started off with Kid Humans Of, and I actually adapted this lesson from Kelly Hilton, who is one of the HyperDoc girls. So this is actually a HyperDoc as well. So these are a bunch of 11 HyperDoc lessons that really lend themselves to a remote learning, blended learning uh, experience. So in this case, I had the students exploring humans of New York and learning a little bit about the humans of New York. And then what I had them do is design their own humans of New York um, visual, but in this case about themselves or about somebody that inspired them. So they work their way through this assignment and then at the end, they, uh, and I support each of every single lesson in here has video tutorials already done. So what's really nice about these lessons is if you're using them with your students, you have all the pieces 
already done for you. They're all in there. They're all set up. And in this case, it has Common Core standards already attached and ISTE standards as well. So this is the first lesson. And it was, and, and then I have each at the end of every lesson. In my case, I had my students share them and collaborate on a Padlet. You can use a Wakelet. You can use a shared Google slide deck. Okay, I, I just kind of give, you know, I want kids, I, if you've watched any of my webinars in the past, I always talk about how powerful it is for kids not just to turn it into you, but to be able to publish it in a place where they can receive feedback. And that's super important, having them be able to publish it somewhere, because as I mentioned earlier, you want then the kids to create something, but then you want to spend time going through it and not just giving you giving feedback, but having the kids deliver feedback as well. And so I actually have in here, I have a lesson for how to give feedback. So each and every lesson touches on different skills we want our students to have. This one, this lesson is great. This is a lesson that focuses on creation literacy because very often we will teach our kids how you know we say to them go create make something so and and when we're designing something around um anything that's visual anything that has any kind of uh, aesthetic we need to teach explicitly how to create and so this is my favorite lesson it's called friends don't let friends use word art i actually have done this many times for adult learners at ISTE and fetc and conferences all over it's one of my favorite lessons to do but i also do it with kids and so what i'm getting them to do is look at why design is important they play a game that where they analyze good and not so good design and then they then apply their skills and now create a new activity a new sorry a new post where they've now learned the skills so what's cool is i start off the unit where i don't teach them design skills and then I do this lesson right after, and I do it intentionally because I want them to be able to say, let's go back to lesson one. Let's look at um, you know, my my the the kid humans. That's what we did. We looked at the padlet and they had created their like their first post, but I hadn't taught them yet how to create more effectively. I didn't talk about design, I didn't talk about aesthetics, and it was interesting because when we went back to it. And you looked at the difference between the designs after they took this lesson. And now I had them go back and, and redo their first uh, lesson. You could see such an improvement in their visual and aesthetics and the way that they were creating. So this was really, really a powerful lesson to get them to understand how. And I referenced this lesson for the whole unit. I always go back to the big ideas the enduring understandings from this lesson throughout the whole unit because it's so foundational to teaching them. So in, in, in social studies, in English, in, in Spanish, in any subject area that you're teaching, if you're getting kids to create a visual, a graphic, a post, a presentation, a slide deck, they need to learn how to create a visual aesthetic. That's really important. We're seeing this more and more, especially when we're having kids presenting more. We have to be able to communicate. Look at what my job requires now. Usually I'm out and I'm presenting at conferences. I do I do more present presentations than I write five paragraph essays any day, right? And so being able to aesthetically tell a story and visually be able to put it together is an essential skill essential in 2020 are everything we do through social media through instagram through facebook any kind of marketing any kind of story you want to tell requires a visual component and so these are essential skills that the kids need to learn how to do and so i walk them and scaffold those skills in this session and so when you go through the session with them and you're able to kind of walk them through the slides and play the game, it's pretty empower, empowering for them to learn how to tell those stories more effectively. And this is just two of my lessons, guys. I have so many in here. So I go in here, this is uh, I Am Poems. 
So in this lesson, I have kids, and by the way, you have access, you can iterate all these lessons. So I, what you do is if you just go to file and you go make a copy, because you have view rights, you're then able to make a copy and modify these lessons to however you want in your class. But they all have a similar format, right? You go in, it has a big question, um, actually, I have, oops, I have to update that one, but I will. But each one then goes through the activities. So it's, it's using a hyperdoc, engage, explore. And in this case, it was real. This is a super simple one. It was super successful because it was basically just getting them to be introduced to Spark Video at this point. And I was giving them some scaffolding of what they could talk about. And they were they did a poem about themselves. And so they had to take adjectives and uh, I am statements, and they then had to create their own video. And they watch one as an example, as a mentor text. And then um, I have them remember like design essentials. We talk about that. And then I get them to create. So they go in and they create their video and then they have um, a tutorial and they are able to create it. So all of these, um, lessons are you're gonna start noticing they have like a similar pattern to them and I think it's important to note like when what I started to realize while doing these lessons is I had about you know let's say uh, you know really five ten minutes of their attention um, and I was using the chat to get them to engage asking questions I have them then if they needed to they, they have the tutorial so that they can go off and watch it on their own, I have time where I give exemplars because you know you're asking kids even when they're in high school to create something. You want to show a mentor example so they have something that they can frame their minds around what you're asking them for. So usually either I'll create the mentor example or if I have done this before, I'll use an example from my students. So each and every lesson has a similar format. And I've noticed, and this is a lot of what Rebecca has done as well, that when you have that kind of like structure around your direct instruction as well, where you need to scaffold those skills, providing that scaffolding the way that I've done it through the engage, explore, you know, apply, like the hyperdoc model. And if you haven't seen my hyperdoc um, webinar, please check it out because that structure really lends itself in this way because it scaffolds the skills that the kids need to learn. So this is at this point, you know, I did another video one and then I realized that they needed more scaffolding to learn how to give better feedback. So I love this lesson because this lesson is the entire lesson is all on how to give better feedback. And in this case, um, I use an, an um, tag feedback, which is so fantastic. And so, um, I, I referenced back the lesson before because I want them to be able to go back and and this is where I really started to teach feedback and you could do this earlier but we talk about uh, building our creative capacity and if you're not uh, familiar with Austin's butterfly I show them Austin's butterfly this video and I you know we have a conversation about how feedback can really improve the quality of your work and then I explain in this particular lesson, I do this lesson like I do, you do. So I do, I watch, I, I walk them through the tutorial, walk through the video, and I have them publish on the iPad, and then they watch the video, right? So this is just the way that I had it structured. So I do, you tell them what you need for the adventure, and so we talk about tag feedback, and then they watch a video on it. And then I explain how to give feedback in the Padlet. So I give them back the Padlet from the assignment from the, the week before. And then they go in and they have to copy and paste this. I like the way you, why did you, it would be cool if, and they have to give the feedback. So I'm explicitly scaffolding how to give feedback. So this is a lesson that I do that. So each and every lesson is super calculated and structured and it has really deep pedagogy that you can go back and use to teach very explicit skills maybe you don't even want to use all 11 lessons you can pull out the tag feedback one or maybe you want to do the the one on video like this is great because you have all of them ready to go for you 
Then I started playing around with some fun activities that really, honestly, these were some of the ones that my students love the most. You know, I've been thinking about their social and emotional well-being during this time where they are stuck at home. And I really want to focus on gratitude with my students because I think when we focus on gratitude and we look at the things that we are grateful for, it helps alleviate a lot of the anxiety and stress that we feel. And I try to do this as myself where I try when I get super anxious to, to be really um, to really be in the moment and think about the things that I am grateful for now. And so that this is a lesson that looks at that. But what we do is we're looking at the place that makes us happiest. So in this case, I have them explore. I watch this video and they go in and I have them go on a trip for inspiration. And so I get them to go into Google Arts and Culture. And if you haven't been in Google Arts and Culture, it's such a treat. It's such a great site and it, and it really, um, go, you can go to all these museums and check all these media texts and there's just so much cool stuff in there. So they go on a virtual field trip there first and I have them explore some, you know, they can search for places and I have them go in and look for places that make them happy. And then what I do is I have them think about their top happy place and I get them to create a post. And, um, and I actually have a tutorial video of how to do it right over here. So I walk them through step by step how to create that post. And then this is the best part. I then have them go into a shared Google Earth that I've created. And they, if you want to create your own, your own, you can. I don't have the tutorial in here for that, but it's pretty straightforward. If not, Google it. But otherwise, you can even just use this one. We can use this as a really fun shared, like, you know, worldly favorite place and they go in and they drop the link of, uh, they, they, they add their happy place. And this is a tutorial video of how to do that. This required a little bit more is my, like a little more, the, the students definitely needed to, to learn this skill a little more. Um, it was a little bit more complex, but even my third graders eventually with like a lot of scaffolding and me kind of sharing my screen and showing it over and over, they were able to get it. But if they, they watch the video again and again, it makes sense. It's a tutorial. And so I had them do that and they loved it. And so that was a lesson that I did with them. And then I get them to do a few more of these. I have them create, um, I take them from their happy place and then I have them exploring their happy song. Again, thinking about social emotional, thinking about getting them to feel to put their head in a place where they feel good, but also teaching skills. Again, I'm applying design and aesthetics literacy. I'm teaching them digital fluency skills because in this particular lesson, they are not, now they have to create a visual. They have to find the lyrics of the song that makes them happy. They, they have to pull out the lyrics um, that, that, that really are like key. So they have to do some reading, right? They then, they have to review aesthetics and design. I always recap what makes a good visual. And then they I have them apply their learning. They have to think of its paired text. So they have to think of a visual that would then go with the lyric. There's a lot of critical thinking that's going on in this lesson. And then I get them to create. And what's really cool is I have them turn this, this one in is so super cool because I have them turn it in on a shared Google slide. And I would write, you know, what you do is you create a collaborative slide and each student then puts it in. And then I teach them how to add, and there's actually a tutorial video in here, how to add a link from um, YouTube into a slide deck. So this is really good like app smashing because they have to learn all these different skills. But then they go in and they create this visual that also on slides. So it's it's an app smash between Adobe Spark Post and um, a slide deck. And they have to then add the, the visual with the, um, the song. And it's really cool because I, um, it, like when you play through it and it's, what's really cool and, and if you get even crazier you can have it play the moment like you can customize it in slides so that when you go on each one it plays on the lyric and so I teach the kids like if you get more advanced how to do that and so when you go through the presentation it's super inspiring because you're going through every slide and you're hearing these really inspirational happy lyrics attach these really beautiful visuals it's such a powerful activity for them to do 
And they, honest to God, I think this was the one that they loved the most that I did with my students. And then again, they can give feedback, they can iterate, you know, they can make it better and better. Um, this was a really fun activity that we did. And it was basically, I had them creating um, a gratitude cards. I had the kids creating um, uh, get well cards. And at the time, my manager was in the hospital um, dealing with COVID. And um, this was really, really meaningful for, for me and for my students because we actually created these cards to send to sick patients in the hospital, including my boss, uh, who thank God is fine now. But um, like this was really powerful. And so we looked at this really inspiring video and we had um, that showed how people were celebrating and, and, and sparking hope in their communities. It's really, really great. And then we spoke about ways that we could help. What are things we can do from home? You know, we have all these people who are home and sick. And so we talked a little bit about that, which was really nice. And then I had the kids, well, in this case, this was the Adobe kids. And what they did was they um, created, uh, and these were some exemplars, get well cards on Spark posts. And then they also created thank you cards for first responders. This was such a great activity. Um, and we actually sent them out to hospitals, um, which was really powerful too. And this is something that you can do with your students tomorrow. And this was a tutorial. And again, you know, we talked about what makes a good visual and the kids created them. So you could see like the way that they're designed, super simple for a one hour lesson. But in the end, they create really meaningful work and then we give them feedback and they get better. And so I, I hope you're starting to kind of see the flow of the way that these work. Um, this is another example, and this is lesson uh, nine. And at this point, I said, you know what? Let's start really thinking about your work and designing work that's really beautiful, but also that, that you can customize. Because with Adobe Spark, the one that you have access to, the upgraded version that schools have, which you have at Palm Beach County and that a lot of districts have, you can create a logo and then start to customize your, your work. And at this point, my students have now created videos and all these graphics and they've been iterating and they're, they're starting to develop quality work. And so what I got them to do is do this really great lesson. I love this lesson where I talk about logo design. The kids loved, loved, loved this activity. And I teach them about, uh, you know, the hidden meanings of logos. And then I teach them how to create a logo and, what, and they create a logo. And so these are some examples of students that I've done this with in the past. Again, I always go back to aesthetics and design. You could see the standard here that's always going deeper and deeper that they're always making sure that they are thinking about. And then I got them to create um, their, their um, a whole bunch of iterations, many logos that they then shared on a shared Google slide deck. And um, from there, I was able to get them to create their brands. And so I take them to that next spot. And so it was really cool to see them, like the quality of their work, just like really explode at this point. Because from there, what I did is I got them to create a portfolio. And so I had them then take all of the creations that they were working on th for the whole entire trimester. Well, not trimester, I mean, it's been, it was what, two, two months or so eight weeks or whatever you call it with my, with my online class that I was doing. And they then created um, a digital portfolio and I share good examples. And so all of these are links so you can go in and show examples. And I, I just walk them through, um, you know, how to create their portfolio. I show examples. And we talked a little bit about what makes a good portfolio. I did this with the class. I share a tutorial of how to create one. And then they went out and created and shared it. So you start seeing this kind of flow of like, you know, there's a bit of engagement. There's some explanation. I show some mentor examples. And then I have kids creating and, you know, sharing their work, going in and then getting some feedback. And then the last one I did before um, I stopped doing these lessons was I decided that it would be really a powerful idea for them to start a 
corn journal or corn folio. And so the whole idea of like memory journal and like, you know, maybe being able to just kind of document this time in history, because as you can imagine, right now this is historic and i thought it would be kind of cool like from a history perspective to be able to go in and find images around current events be able to kind of journal a little bit of like what they've been doing what they've been learning about what they've been hearing about the science and sort of just pull some of those big ideas into this journal as a reflective activity that they can come back to when they're you know, 10 years from now and be able to be like, wow, I remember that time because right now what's going on in, in the world is unprecedented. And so, um, I developed this lesson to kind of get them thinking about, um, you know, how, how they could document their, their, their time right now. Um, and so those are my 11 lessons. This is really a unit that I think could be applicable, as I said, in, in really any subject area and um, you know i think you could look at it from a different lenses you could add pieces to it but i think this is so much fun for the kids because they're really learning skills they're they're learning about how to be better creators um they're learning about how um they can document the the work that they're doing in a beautiful way um, but I leave like all of these are accessible to you. And, and here were just some examples of some of the work that some of my students started with. And I only showed a few, but like this was a kid humans where they were talking about talking about what inspires you. Um, and so this was just like, and this was before I taught aesthetics and design. Um, so they, you know, they were talking about that. And then this was like friends don't let friends use word art. And I had them, um, create a visual based on some of the big ideas from the lesson. And so like, and then apply some of the design um, that we were like, that, that I was showing. And so I love these, like keep, keep it simple, use the space. So they started to really think about like the design and aesthetics. And so these were some of the assignments that Rebecca had done as well that I wanted to kind of just talk a little bit about like how she designed them. And so when in her case, she wasn't using my like tutorials or like hyperdocs. She was using uh, Google Classroom and that might be what you're doing as well. And so she kept it super simple. And, and what she did is like she had them create three book cover designs which is super cool another great idea like you know having kids create book covers with adobe spark um and so she required you know she has the objectives the requirements she she always says like not more than three you know videos max um you don't want to have kids watching a gajillion videos that you know three four minute videos the tutorials um she makes by herself and i do the same thing and i'll say this like I make the tutorials, but not so much about like, um, in her case, what she does is she talks, she walks the kids through her thinking as a designer. Um, so like, that's a really great idea as well. So like walking them through like the choices that they might make, like that, like, oh, I might use this or I might use that, like as part of creating. So it forces her to actually do the assignment as well. And it's great because the kids hear your voice, you know, your learners, you know how to explain it. And I use Screencastify to record those. So I'll make those little tutorials and add them in. And so these are just some examples of some of the students work that she had done. And I love these like quarantining, like the places I could be the quarantine diaries, the question of fate. These are so smart, like the books, that like of the books that you would write right now like what a great activity um and then this was what she has them do and i encourage you to go back and like this but she will have them um give feedback and so this is part of that process that we were talking about with tag feedback but what she does is she requires the students to go back and get feedback from three other people and make changes to two files and re uh, re-upload and reflect. So this is how she does it to get them to create better quality work. It's not enough to just say go reflect. She embeds it as part of like her grading and part of the criteria for the assignment. And you can see like how much better the work gets. So lessons learned, and I know we only have a few minutes left. So I want you to remember like keep the tech frustration low with your with your students and the creative control for the your students like for the kids high 
So like, I try not to be super explicit about like, you need to have five images and four, you know, paragraphs and they need to have, you know, 10 different, uh, you know, uh, layouts. Like I try to give them a variety of ideas of things that they could do, but in the end, you want them to explore and, and try to learn how to be more creative with the tools that they have access to. I uh, definitely believe in this, like always include an option for student expression. I think that's really powerful. Like my son right now is obsessed with Minecraft, and so he's creating and building worlds, and that is an option that his teacher now has allowed him to do. Um, and, and so, but he's then pulling in his ideas and explaining them in a Spark video. So I have them, you know, using different tools, being creative, but providing them with some choice to do that. And then the focus around feedback and connection is everything. Like you, the relationships you have with your students really will shine during this time because they will do more for you. Um, just very quickly, if you're using Chromebooks, there's Adobe Spark that you have access to. There's also Lightroom, uh, which is a really cool uh, editing tool that is accessible for your students as well. And I've created, uh, I, I'm not created, I've attached instructions on how to log in. And then I've shared, and I'm not going to go into this, even some more projects that you can use. So I, I created a, a manifesto project that I used last year. I've created and I've shared it with you here, and these are some examples. Um, these are my personal branding narrative uh, unit. This is a whole unit on building narratives um, in Spark, um, and they're all about personal branding, personal stories. It's really great. So it's all there. Um, here's some more project ideas as well. And taking it further, get kids to create their own brand. And so I don't have time to show that to you today. Maybe I'll come on at another uh, time. But you know, you could take it further. Having the kids then brand their work with visually that is so powerful. There's a lesson plan here on how to get started with that. And at the end, it, there's a tutorial that walks you through it. So, whew, any questions? <laughs> I, I hope I gave you a lot. I'm hoping you have a lot to, to, to go with, a lot to look at. You have all my ideas, all of my lessons. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I would be happy to co-teach a class with you. So uh, are there any questions? I don't know if I saw many questions left. There are just so many great ideas that people were sharing in the chat, which was awesome. They got some great ideas from you. Um, I think we all have to go, whew. Um, lots of content, but it's amazing what you created. And um, just reminding everyone from that main document, all of those um, those slide decks, you just do file, make a copy, and it's yours. You customize it for how you want to use it with your own students. So I put all the hours of work for you. Yep. All of them. And trust me, it was a lot of work. <laughs> so, yes, but you can totally see it. It's awesome. Oh, thank, you. thank you. And uh, they're, they're creative enough that you have creative control and, and the objectives are there. And, you know, I didn't create rubrics for them, but they really are based around the ISTE standards for the most part. And um, I saw as I was going to do like a few things I'm going to update tonight, Woo! but they're yeah. all there. And, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Like I said, you could use them at the end of the year, pick and choose, but truly like those lessons you can use next year. They're so good. Yeah. We don't know what distance learning is going to look like for next year. Exactly. We really don't. And so like you can start, this is a great unit to start with your class at the beginning of the school year. Yes, for sure. Awesome. Thanks again, Tanya. Thanks. Um, just a couple things as we end, I know we're a little over already, but just a reminder, um, June 9th and 10th, we're going to be holding our Digital Learning uh, Institute remotely this year, obviously. Um, re registration's now open, so I have uh, put the link in the chat box for you to register. Uh, Tanya's also going to be doing a session there for us as well, so that's going to be super exciting. Um, coming up the rest of today, we have... Um, a code.org, how you can use code.org during teaching remotely. There are lots of great things that code.org has to offer. Um, so you can integrate coding into your remote learning as well. On Wednesday, we're going to have another teacher panel at 8 a.m. Our smart group is going to join us at 1230. We had the wrong time this morning at 1230 on Wednesday. And then at 2 o'clock, our physical education team is going to share ways that you can actually de disconnect and uh, start to get more active. 
Also, as we are starting to share next week on Monday, we're going to be starting to do virtual field trips and virtual uh, career chats. So um, our schedule will hopefully go live starting tomorrow. So please keep an eye on that specific website on our webpage um, for all of that information. And as always, our, uh, our team of people is ready to help you in our district if you have questions. So please feel free to fill out that quick form if you have any questions on how to use any tool, Google, Smart, Apple, everything that under the sun, they will help you in how to integrate. Just feel free to, uh, to fill out that form and someone will get back to you normally the same day. So um, with that, I wanna thank everyone for coming, especially Tanya, we appreciate you. For all the groups that were in the chat, I noticed ESE was in the chat, I noticed uh, school counseling was in the chat. Don't hesitate to reach out to Tanya. She would love to work with your groups. She would love to work with the ESE team. The counseling team, I think, is an awesome opportunity to bring some of that SEL um, into the chat as well. So um, please don't hesitate to reach out to Tanya. Okay. Excuse me. I am here. Anytime, For sure. Anytime. Anytime. I've done private one-on-ones with teachers. I say this all the time. You don't realize, like, you have me here. Use me. I'm happy to help. Awesome. So thank everyone for joining us and just have a great day. We hope to see you again at 2.30. Bye-bye, everyone.